a very good afternoon all myself dr nagamani on behalf of drug discovery hackathon 2020 training committee chairman dr gn shastri i welcome you all for the vertical one session today we have dr amit prasad from indian institute of technology mandi to deliver the lecture vertical one dr amit prasad completed his phd in sanjay gandhi post graduate institute of medical science lucknow in 2008 and currently he is working as assistant professor in iit mandi his area of research is to understand the role of innate immune cells in inflammatory disorders host pathogen intra interactions he also involved in the designing of medical devices using biosensors he received various awards including dbt ramalinga swami fellowship and dst ramanujam philosophy in the year of 2004 with this introduction i request dr amit to deliver his talk on immunoinformatics for drugs and vaccine over to you sir Thank please you, sir. share your slide before you start Yes, we are able to. Yeah. Oh, okay. thank you. Thank you, Doctor Nagamani, for the nice introduction. And uh, um, good good afternoon, everybody, and very uh, and all the welcome to the, all the learners. I am very happy to to be the part of this great initiative of the PMO under the able leadership of our uh, PSA, you know, Professor Vijay Raghavan, DGCSR. Professor Sekhar Mande and I, AICTC Chairman Professor Sarth Gupta, and this program is where of drug discovery of hackathon is well coordinated by the Chief Innovative Officer Dr. Ajay Jere, and we have been working for this hackathon from last two two and a half month, and I am happy that I got such a nice team, and this training session which is like intended to. Create a large pool of talent to take the future challenge of the drug discovery is the brainchild of the professor Vijay uh, Raghavan, which is and it is headed by the Dr. Narayan Sastri, Director, CSR Institute of Northeast Institute of Science and Technology, and the rest of the patron of this uh, initiative. So, <clears throat> and I am also thankful to all you people who have joined today and putting their effort to take this hackathon forward. Okay. There are few disclaimers. Like I have used the slides from the different or the figures from the various sources, which is are like for the from the just for the educational purposes. Few places you will hear that I will be taking the name of some commercial software or some names, with, but which is just for the teaching. The users or the participant can decide just on their own discussion. Like any conflict of interest to disclose. So what we are going to learn in this uh, today's session? So first thing which will be, I will be like I say that I will be talking about a little bit immunology, considering that the all the users or the participants like will be having various background. We are expecting that many people people based on having background in chemistry and pharmacology, they will be part. Use what is immunoinformatics, and then we'll be discussing about the use of immunoinformatics in drugs and vaccine development. So, coming to the first, like we live in a world which is we say that it is a food of pathogen. If you will see that our body consists of various is about 10 to power 30, but at the same time, if you will count. The number of microbes like the bacteria, fungi, uh, protozoans which resides in our body, okay, they make the total number of count it goes to 10 to the power 14. So that is like for each cell we have 10 bacteria or the fungus or a microbes present in our body. So we virtually live in a uh, environment or the world of the pathogens. When we ever, whenever we are inhaling the air, the microbes are going inside our lungs. 
whenever we are touching a, uh, any surface, a substance, we are touching a lots of microbes. Whenever we are moving in the, into in the environment, again we are interacting with the subrel of the pathogens. And as we know that in the current scenario, this COVID, we know that this passed from the one person to one person by just through the taking the help of the aerosol now, like it is coming through the ears. So what happens? So these all microbes or the uh, small small cells which resides out in our body, they makes the normal flora. These are called normal flora, uh, flora, and they make the part of the microbiome. And these they usually are limited to certain areas of the body, but can include like skin, mouth, large intestine, sexual organ, and they all constitute the microbiome of the body. But all these microflora are not called pathogens, right? Because they just live with us. Their purpose is that we normally think that all these patho microbes are hostile, they can infect us, but it's not like that. They, and we use the term like pathogen. They are not invaders, or that they, that, that they are there to attack our body. But a pathogen or parasite like any other organisms is simply trying to live and procreate living at the expense of host organism a very attractive strategy because the we are the, like the host are the rich source of protein and all the ingredients needed for a microbes to grow. So they usually develop a highly specialized mechanism for crossing cellular and biochemical barriers which are created by our skin or the host and for eliciting specific response from the host organism and that contribute to the survival and multiplication of the pathogen. So here comes the immune system. So we have all the we have the immune system which protects us from the, all the infection. It pro and keep us uh, as healthy and happy. <coughs> so immune system have the function of like, like they protect us by identifying and destroying the pathogens. They act as a housekeeping they, by removing of the debris and dead cells. They keep the surveillance of the infected cells and they remove them. And they keep doing the communication. They release a lot of chemical messenger, which we call like cytokines, or like, um, and they do the purpose of antigen presentation. They keep the immunological memory. All these are the part of the immune of the immune system. Broadly, the immune system have different uh, organs, which is divided into primary and secondary lymphoid organs, and they are connected with, with each other with the help of uh, lymphatic channels. So, thymus, bone marrow, uh, and the uh, tonsils, these are the primary lymphoid organs where we develop all the immune cells, okay, and, we, and there are several uh, uh, glands across the body which are used for the maturation of these immune cells. So immune system, that's why we can say that it's a vital for the um, our survival. And give us natural protection against invaders. So the, again, this the mechanism of immune surveillance or protection is divided into three stages where like barriers, level one, which is normal barrier, like skin, and cilia present to prevent invaders from entering our skin, which is the primary, so which act as a primary wall against any bacteria or the invaders. Then label two is the innate immune system, where the several cells, a specific kind of the cells, a group of the cells, and few chemicals which stop invaders from the spreading, even if they have entered the body. And the label three is adoptive immune system, which is like blood warriors. Which is like uh, okay, so if you will see the part of the immune system, like as I will say, like different kinds of the cells are there to make it a immune cell. So these like have been divided into two parts, as innate immune system and adoptive immune system. In the innate part, you will see that like all the cells are coming from the all the cells coming for the immune in, in, in the immune system. They will be coming from the hematopoietic immune cell. Hematopoietic stem cells, and from there they divide uh, into the myeloid progenitor and lymphoid progenitor. And from the myeloid progenitor, all the cells coming there are like uh, mast cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, macrophages, 
and dendritic cells these make the innate lumen part and from the lymphoid to genital cells the cells coming like T cells, B cells and plasma cells they form the adoptive lumen part but these two parts are not like you will see that here also that NK cells is coming from the lymphoid side but it comes into the innate part and similarly dendritic cells which is coming from the myeloid side but is considered to be the part of the adoptive immune system too. so they, they are work together and they give protection so broadly like for the if you will see that what are the characteristics of the innate immune system is like that innate immunity has they are effective effective against the invaders but our food prevention as like like mostly whenever we get an infection like what we have and we get to develop this fever fever is a part of the innate immune system, protection mechanism then inflammation that is also the part of the innate immunity so that's why they are considered as the first line of defense and they actively identify and remove the unwanted invaders and they are really fast the other part is adoptive immunity which is highly targeted it's like b cells which gives you the antibodies these are like made to specific epitopes and they are highly targeted and they are powerful but they slow to develop they usually take weeks to develop but the good part is that they have the memory so whenever we say that um, innate and adoptive it's not like that these two parts are parts are working in their isolation they must work together to give an effective protection mechanism so it will see that like macrophage and neutrophils which are the main which are the main backbone of the innate immunity whenever they identify a invaders or a pathogen okay so they go over there neutrophils which is considered as the first line of defense okay they will go over there at the site of inflammation or the infection and they will try to engulf the uh, invader or the pathogen which may be a bacteria and they will digest it but if they fail the macrophage some many times tissue resident macrophages present over there they help in them, them in this process they also do phagocytosis the capacity of phagocytosis of macrophage are considered to be much higher than the neutrophils so that means they can engulf a large number of invading pathogens and these invading and um, when they start eating the macro the, the pathogens or the bacteria they get activated and these activated neutrophils and macrophages they release a number of cytokines and chemokines so these cytokines and chemokines are the chemical messengers which give signals to other cells in the vicinity or in the area that there is some problem come and help so all the other macrophages neutrophils they will come over there and they will try to engulf the pathogens at the same time these macrophages neutrophils they are also considered as called professional antigen presenting cells so they will present these they will digest the pathogen and present their specific signature to the other part of the immune system that is adoptive immune system with the help of dendritic cells for the maturation of T cells when T cell receptors bind with the these antigens presented along with the MHC molecule they gives mature from the night T cells they mature and they give the T cells at the same time the T cell receptors when they bind with the epitope presented with the MHC molecules they get developed in the presence of T cells and they give the antibodies and that's how this whole adoptive and immune system works together so identification of the identification of the uh, pathogen is one of the most important um, thing for the uh, working of this uh, immune system and this identification works on the based on the certain molecular signature so when a pathogen enters the body the cells in the blood and lymph detect the specific pathogen associated molecular pattern which are the signature kind signature to kind of a signature molecules present on the pathogens which they, they are detected by the and they are presented uh, like uh, they are presented along with the pathogen recognition receptors present on the immune cells so pathogen receptor and these tamps like or uh, that is the molecular patterns of the pathogens are made of usually are carbohydrate a signature of carbohydrate a, a specific signature of nucleic acid 
or the protein. These all are detected by pathogen recognition receptors. And we, you must guys must have heard about that. This main, most commonly um, uh, pathogen recognition receptors are the toll-like receptors. So these toll-like receptors. Similarly, we have um, other receptors present, like nod-like receptors. See, um, nod-like receptors present in the cytoplasm. This all detects the pathogens specific signature sequence. So it's um, this identification of signature uh, signature sequence present in the pathogens, and at the same time, presence of spe specific receptors receptors present on the immune cells. That means they have specific moieties which can be used for the uh, uh, for the software uh, for a software or making a program. So immune system has specific cells with receptors that recognize these stamps. A macrophage is a large phagocytic cells that engulf foreign particles and pathogens. And macrophage recognize PAMs by a complementary pattern recognition receptors, the PRRs. And these PRRs, in the, with, the, with the help of the PAMs, they, they, are get, they get presented and that's how the immune system gets activated. A monocyte, a type of leukocytes that circulate in the blood and then differentiate into macrophages and it uptake moves into infected tissue. And then the dendritic cells, which can bind to molecular signature of pathogens, prompting pathogen engulfment and destruction. And all these things work in together. So, as number of, if you will see that number of tall like receptors, lactin receptors, or nod like receptors are present. And these, as I said, that having some specific pattern. And these patterns can be used for the development of this, uh, you know, programming or a software. And all these recognition interaction depends upon a specific molecular pattern because this, like, if you will see that, like, okay, that TLR4 uh, is responsible for identifying lipopolysaccharides. Similarly, TLR3, C3, A7, 9, they are for the nucleic acid. So they all are like, we have a, a, a determination, like, to, to which kind of moiety they are going to attach. So these all information gives a chance that we can use these properties to develop a, a, a algorithm. So from the last like if you will see that like uh, after the when the whole genome sequencing came so lots of data started coming about the uh, from the various aspect of the biological sciences one of them is the about the, about the expression pattern of the cytokines or the genes related with the disease or the, uh, in, or the uh, gene responsible for the virulence factor, all these started coming. And then we have a, a we gradually a new area develop is of the, um, of the bioinformatics developed, which is called immunoinformatics, which you, if you will say in terms of Wikipedia, it says that immunoinformatics or computational immunology. It is an emerging area that provides fundamental methodology in the study of immunomics, that is immune-related genomics and proteomics. So in this mm, immunoinformatics, so all the different part of like genome sequencing of humans and other organisms, then designing and engineering of immune therapeutics, and understanding the host pathogen interactions, identifying the virulence gene, T or B cell epitope prediction, all the, or toxicity prediction, immunonomic database designing, or in silico vaccine designing, these all parts of from the parts of the immunoinformatics. That includes the study and design of algorithm also for mapping potential B cell, T cell epitopes, which lessens the time and cost required for the laboratory analysis of pathogen and gene product. So if you if, if broadly, if you want to divide, there are three different areas of immunoinformatics like target prediction, which involves the pharmacophore modeling, molecular docking, guilt by association, and deep neural networks. And another aspect is drug repurposing, where the drug target interaction is studied, then with lots of connectivity mapping, and where our toxicity is studied, like side effect prediction, drug target interaction, molecular networks and casualty analysis, this all forms the part of the immunoinformatics. So, important thing is that why we need this immunoinformatics? 
So just I am giving the uh, two examples why we need it for the drug, drug discovery like this hackathon is mainly oriented toward the drug discovery. So here is the traditional drug discovery timeline if you see here like from the every for target identification, validation, lead identification, candidate optimization. So we have to spend number of years and resources. Those who are involved in the drug discovery, they must be must be aware that these processes are not only cumbersome and time taking, but also it are resource consumption. It involves lots of money. And then after that, we know that like if you start with that hundred thousand of the molecules, finally after ten years of the experiment, only one molecule reach up to the clinical trial stage. So. To reduce the and so, but if, you, if we use the artificial intelligence or the immunoinformatics for the drug discovery, you can see that all this time period can be reduced into 0.5 to 1 year. So, 3 to 4, 5 years of work can be just done into the less than in a year. So, this is a huge leap forward in the, the discovery of the drugs and it saves time, it saves money, and we can come up with a, a new drug. In a very short time period. As we cannot remove this preclinical and clinical stage, there we cannot, but still people are trying, like where we can use the you know immunoinformatics over there also, just so that we don't have to go for the mice study and we can directly go for the clinical trial. But they, here from this uh, cartoon, it is very much clear that why we need the, the immunoinformatics for the drug discovery. Similarly, for drug repurposing, it takes years or uh, like 10 years to develop a <laughs> get a drug or molecule and for discovery or drug or for the new years like we can use that to help of the um, drug repurposing and then we can make any drugs available for the a new disease which has came very easily so what is and that is exactly what going on in the current scenario for the COVID. You guys must be aware that a number of drugs which have been repurposed and have been tried to whether that they can be used for the treatment of the COVID. And all they have used is immunoinformatics uh, to, to reach up to that stage. So um, for, um, for a good outcome of immunoinformatics, the most important thing is the development of a pipeline. So pipeline is like how we like um, algorithm where we write the algorithm with all the tricks, uh, input and output parameter, decision makings, where we do the refinement of the data. All these are part of the making a uh, pipeline where it, it, at each and every stage there is a decision making whether we have to take this uh, uh, result forward or we can stop over here and we can go for something you know, something else which is coming through uh, coming through this pipeline so this uh, a pipeline involves data analysis data refinement acquisition of new knowledge then we are going for in vitro experiment if we get all the data after computational modeling and simulation and generation of new hypothesis and then we can go for the design of the experiment and this saves in the time so the pipelines a good pipeline should be based on the knowledge and essential feature for a pipeline. If we don't have a robust pipeline, then the most of the result what we will get in, it will be of no, no use. So whenever you are designing a pipeline for a, any kind of immunoinformatics work, make sure that your data pipeline is based on the best available knowledge and it is robust. So I am just here giving you the comparison for a traditional way of chemical screening. So you guys must have seen this 96 well plates or 384 assay plates. For any chemical screening, if you see that, what we do that we do a lot of we do a lot of screening. Okay, what we do, we take suppose if you want to identify a drug for a specific phenotype, suppose you want to see the actin filament polymerization in a cell. What you will do, you will culture the cells in 96 well culture plates or whatever you can do. You can take the help of the robotics also to culture. And suppose you, if you have a library of suppose, suppose 100,000 molecules, so it's, that means that much say in wells you will have to use. And then you, what you will do, you will add those molecules 
in triplicate in different uses, in plates you will go for the dispensing of your assay medium then you want to see that like if you want to see the as i say that acting polymerization so probably you will do some fluorescent staining and then you will do a number of assay to estimate like okay luminescence or flow cytometry to your microscopy although you can use the you know high, high throughput uh, microscopy or flow cytometry but all this if effort we will have to put in and all this effort is not so easy designing an assay itself takes a lot of time then doing all these experiments these are resource consuming human that needs lots of skilled manpower resources high in instrument and then so much consumables so it's take a lot of time so that's why here comes the virtual screening so in virtual screening what we have to do it doesn't need that much you know resource and it can go very fast so virtual screening what is it is a computational technique so used to identify a compound of interest by screening in silico library so in silico library is what it is a library of chemical compounds used to screen potential ligands of the interest means virtual screening is in contrast to the high throughput virtual screening speeds up process of finding ligand of interest a common server can screen a large number of molecules in a day based upon stringency of a process so virtual screening binding affinity is calculate, calculated in silico using docking or qsr or pharmacophore etc or whatever like you want to take the, as a parameter and then it acts as a sieve or filter which allow to pass out ligands not of interest and depends upon parameters like steric hindrance complementary etc and it can save cost and speed up identification of ligands of interest generally it filters out about 98 to 99% of ligands unlikely to molecule of interest and it saves a purchasing and testing of large number of compounds also however it has been seen that majority of identified compound compounds are false false positive and it happens due to the imperfection in methodology or algorithm of screen program so that's why i said that whenever we are doing any virtual screening and when we, whenever we are trying to use the for immunoinformatics the most important thing is that we should make a robust and reliable pipeline based on the best of the and then this virtual screening can be divided into two parts it can be of receptor based and it can be ligand receptor based ligand uh, receptor based or ligand receptor based so receptor based screen screening also it is also called a structure based uh, it is also called a structure based so needs uh, it needs information about the structure information of target or and like that can be like atomic structure or x-ray crystallographic structure or nmr data which is whatever a homology model can be done and that can be used and binding of pocket for talking depending upon which we find ligands that can bind hence we are looking and the ligands required since structures spatial structure are not available we build, we can build them computationally and are reliable since because they have relatively small number of rotable towers so it is completely based on the stereochemical and physiochemical properties of binding pockets of target and high chance of finding novel class of compounds but the pitfall is that high chance of false positive is also there and due to the solvation or dissolvation effect not considered in case of the receptor based um, virtual screening the another screening method is the ligand receptor based which we don't need information about the target but we only need info about the already available ligands with their properties from the database and only biological information of the these ligands based on similarity similar ligands will have similar functions so it but the here the, the uh, here the problem is that as we are using the already available the databases and we are using the similarity search for the and, and pharmacophore mapping so the finding of a new novel class okay that is not over there but the advantage is that it's a lesser chance of false positive so if you will ask what is the advantage of using the you know virtual screening so then if you can say that it is very easy to establish the high throughput screening or hits or to identify the hits it's very highly rapid and it is cost effective and it, it, it reduces the number of hits for in vitro study at the same time because we are narrowing down our information 
but the dis disadvantage is the high rate of false positive and few false negative too sometimes and uh, but anyway like for uh, all, there are some always you know pros and cons of any of the tools so but still we see that the advantage associated with the virtual screening is much higher compared to the disadvantage so another important tool of the immunoinformatics is the peptide inhibitors like which is also like you know that more than 80 peptides now are in use as a drug which have been approved by the FDA for various diseases and people do believe that the in future like more and more of the peptide inhibitors will be in use for the as a drug so in the first step for the peptide drug discovery is the data mining where So we have suppose we have a set of proteins and need to identify anti-inflammatory proteins from the set of the MAP kinase. MAP kinase is a signaling pathway inside the cells. So suppose we want to do a anyway I want to identify this inhibitor this MAP kinase. So we build a QSR or neural network and train the model with existing anti-inflammatory proteins. So you guys must be aware that QSR is nothing. It is a mathematical relationship. between chemical and geometrical uh, characteristic of ligand and their biological activity and it is often combined with the pharmacophore modeling so based on the we will make a qsr model we taking their proteins from the literature then their biological features like anti inflammatory anti hypersensitivity beta blocker they are signature motif or the particular amino acid propensity at a position and based on this we make a qsr model and the qsr model extracts such novel, novel feature with the help of training set for example anti inflammatory peptides they have high propensity of arginine or lysine at the terminals which imparts net positive charge so there after the training set when we input we input the model with test set it will extract the protein with the features and generate a library and this having this library will be having a certain kind of feature extracted and thus reducing a library of 10000 to the of the molecules 200 these peptides are studied for their various pharmacophore properties hydrophobicity charge ionizable groups etc they impact the biological property and for what its report the following is the ligand is docked against a target and is scored so for more talking they the in, in, in the tracks we already the lectures are going on so just follow that and then this will ligand will be docked and the based on the scoring the scheme which are a very crucial to the a robust model is derived then there are three important application of scoring function in molecular docking so the molecular docking is a very it can be empirical it will be knowledge based and it can be force field applied so given a protein target molecular docking generates a hundred of thousands of repetitive ligand binding orientation confrontation at the end of sites around the protein a scoring function is used to rank these ligands orientation confrontation confirmation by evaluating the binding tightness of each of the repetitive complexes an ideal scoring function would rank the experimentally determined binding mode most highly given the determined binding mode of ligand scientists would be able to gain a deep understanding of the molecular mechanisms of ligand binding and to further design an efficient drug by modifying the protein so the second application of a scoring function which is related to the first application is to predict the absolute binding affinity between protein and ligand and this is particularly important in lead optimization lead optimization is referred to the process to improve the tightness of binding for low affinity heaps or lead compounds that have been identified during during this process an accurate scoring function can greatly increase the optimization efficiency and save cost by computationally predicting the binding affinity between the protein and modified ligands before much more expensive step of ligand synthesis and experimental testing the third application of the in silico peptide in the designing or through the modeling is that perhaps the more it is the in structure based drug designing it is to identify the potential drug leads leads for a given protein target by searching a large ligand database that are like virtual database screening 
it is a reliable and they give a reliable scoring function should be able to rank known binders most highly according to their binding scores. And during database screening, given the expensive cost of experimental screening and sometimes unavailability of the high throughput assay, virtual database screening has played an increasingly important, important role in drug, drug discovery. And you guys might have been seen like so there are several papers now started coming where we just keep the in silico scale or modeling or data and you can even publish in decent journals. And many existing scoring functions perform well only work on one or two of the three applications. Roughly the scoring functions can be grouped into three basic types according to how they are derived like force field, empirical, knowledge based. <coughs> So after getting this uh, in silico peptide inhibitor, we further do the refinement by looking the property of the um, of the peptides we have identified. For this identification of the property of the peptides we have come through the modeling, we use the several uh, several tools. So I am just giving few tools. Although I was I plan to give the live demo of these tools, but due to the, some technical issue, we cannot do that. So here I am just giving you the you know. Some screenshots and name of the some tools which I feel like is good. But you, if you will do the every browsing for like whatever the purpose you are looking for a tool, you will get a number of. But I will just caution before deciding any tool that you are going to use for your pipeline. Be sure that those tools have been used by the scientific community rigorously or have been evaluated rigorously and are in use. Otherwise, as I said in the in the Second slide of immunoinformatics. The major problem is that these the, we may lead to for a, for a place where it is all, all the false positive will be higher. So just for here, like anti-inflammatory peptide, as in our previous my previous slide, I say that the suppose here the motto is to identify the MAP kinase inhibitor, like as or into which should be an anti-inflammatory. This anti-inflammatory peptide inhibitor it is from, from the protein X. So in this software. We identify the protein of interest from the literature library as we discussed, the neural network by anti-inflammatory proteins. Then it generates a FASTA file for the protein and then fragment protein into the peptides. And here you can see that then we can select all available enzymes in the chemistry to make a peptide with fragments. Or we can select only like here, like we have selected the kind of protein which is for the high specificity, like based on the knowledge. Uh, if I have like I have to use the anti-inflammatory proteins to block a targets like suppose ABC and from the I have to identify the from the protein which may be suppose XY then I will build my KSR model with the literature and extract the feature for anti-inflammatory and as in out in my test set I get anti-inflammatory protein. So before designing any pipeline so what is important is that we should go with the whatever the literature is there. Okay, and then you decide. Then important feature is that cross validation. If you have got a, any peptide or any drug from one kind of thing, it's very important that you should also value, verify the same, uh, verify your result from some other tools also. To cross validate and add robustness, then that will increase your the strength of your study. I here like we do may search using the online server for which I to generate a peptide cutter. And we use the peptides as validated with the AI play, that is artificial intelligence peptide predictor, okay, or pre AI, and make my hits more robust. I made here my hits more robust by checking peptide for pharmacophore properties like cell permeability, IC50, or toxicity, and the hits with desired criteria used for talking. So here you can see that then when we, I finally got the results where I selected the six of the peptides with the high probability for anti-inflammatory molecule. And then these were used for the further studies. Similarly, like the, okay, so if you are looking for a protein which should not, which should, um, yes, which should be present on the uh, cell uh, membrane, cell PPD is an important tool or server, which is, it is an in silico method, but not to predict the design efficient cell penetrating peptide because the purpose of the whole the, this module where I am saying that we are looking for a peptide inhibitor. So if we are looking that this should be should work as a drug, then it should be it is important that this drug should be cell permeable. So then we can use this tool where the 
to predict the and design efficient self penetrating peptide. The main data set used in this method consists of 708 experimentally validated cell permeable proteins and they include uh, the, and the major features are like designing peptide. This module allows users to generate all possible single mutant analogs. It also allows the multiple peptides to, uh, the, in this module can predict multiple peptides and submitted at the same time by the user. And this module also generates all possible overlapping peptides and their single mutant analogs of the protein submitted by the user. It also predicts whether the overlapping peptide or analogs is cell permeable or not. And this also gives a chance for you to, for the motif scan, which is like allow user to identify cell permeable peptide in their sequence. So, and one of the major features of this survey is that it also calculates various physiochemical properties like peptide analogs can and can be displayed in sorting order based upon desired properties. So, that, and I find really like this uh, uh, tool is very uh, easy and of good use. Getting all these peptides, so important, another important issue is that whether your peptide inhibitor uh, is binding with the receptors. For that, what we do that protein peptide docking, like as we go for the chemical docking, similarly we do the protein peptide docking. And most of us know that for the docking whenever we talk, we go for the Schrodinger and some paid tools. But here just I am mentioning that these are the you know web-based tools which are good in like you know can be used and they are really very good, just like caps doc or the this. MD doc pep server. This is really a good for the pep to, to predict the peptide binding or docking. And here in the this uh, MD, M, M doc pep server, here you can give the rank score, and from there uh, ten different predicted binding modes, and from there you can select the different structure and then further refine it. So another important purpose of immunoinformatics is the drug repurposing. So, and this is as I said that drug repurposing is now it is is very much required that because it saves a lot of time and we have a you know millions of compounds or the chemicals already available and several of them has been like having the drug like quality but has not been used for any disease. So it's important if we are going looking for a new drugs and if we can use some of already discovered FDA approved drugs then it will say it will save lot of time lot of money so and that will also serve the man, mankind better because we can save the life also so so for the drug repurposing lack, lack of definitive disease altering therapeutics the limited understanding of the mechanism driving novel illness with the slow pace and high cost of drug development is the are the issue and for this this reason, the drug repurposing both a less expensive and time efficient practice compared to de novo drug development has been a promising stress strategy. While empirical drug repurposing has been a routine practice in diseases like cancer, innovative, informed, and cost effective repurposing efforts used genetic data or omics have been designed to characterize drugs by structure and transcriptomic signature. These strategy in conjunction with the ontological integration provide an important opportunity to address knowledge-based challenge. We discuss various signature-based in silico approach for the drug repurposing here and its integration with the multiple omics platform and how this data can be used for the clinically relevant evidence-based drug repurposing. These tools provide an exciting translational avenue to merge omics-based trust drug discovery platform with the patient specific disease signatures. So, <clears throat> So, one of the most again here the important thing is that search strategy what search strategy we are going to do for the identity for being the repurposing the most important thing is the literature survey identify all the permit of the papers in the permit permit central midline and exclude exclude whatever is not published in the peer reviewed article journals okay and for the in search strategy the important thing is that what Inhibitor or like like what like uh, anti-inflammatory molecules, then these molecules, what should be there in your search strategy, and how you are using the and or all. So if you are using and, then it, it will include everything. Suppose you are putting in your keyword as a protease inhibitor and anti-hypertensive, then it will include all the study having both protease inhibitor and anti-hypertensive as keywords. But if you are using the or 
will exclude. So what you want from your search is a literature search. You should be very careful and use the right kind of the keywords. Then the important thing is that data mining from retrieved literature source, like which kind of uh, where they have been published, whether they have been, uh, uh, what kind of essay have been used in those literatures, what animal model have been used, what kind of biological, and then we need the extraction of the data, like what kind, what kind of the biological variables or experimental procedures have been used for the finding of the those molecules, and then quality assessment of the literature, or that called meta-analysis. All these should be the part of the search strategy, strategy for the drug repurposing. So another important thing to know about drug repurposing is the ATC code. This, is, this ATC code is to identify class of drug and this is a pharmaceutical coding system. This divides the drugs into different groups according to the organ or system on which they act, their therapeutic intent or nature and the drug chemical characteristic. Different brands share the same code if they have the same active substance and indication. So each bottom label ATC codes stand for a pharmaceutically used substance or a combination of substances in a single indication. This means that one drug can have more than one code. For example, acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin has A01, AD05 for WHO as a drug for local oral treatment. And similarly for B01, AC, AC06 as a platelet inhibitor, but both are like aspirin. And then we, we should keep in mind that we can use this and then the ATC classification system is a strictly strict hierarchy meaning that each code necessarily has one and only one parent code except for the 14 codes at the topmost level which have no parents. The codes are say, semantic identifiers meaning they depict information by themselves beyond certain identifiers namely the codes depict themselves the complete lineage of parent code. It was first published in 1976 and then it's like it's from that time it is like here there with the World Health Organization collaborating center for drug status and similarly for after this drug based purposing there are few important drugs data bank like cake drugs, PubCam, drug bank, CAMBL, CH EMDL then systematic pharmacological database. This is last one, the systematic pharmacological database. This also in this database we can also look for that what kind of doses have been used and in what kind of disease. So this I find this like really this is very useful. You guys should try this one. So then another is the haptic target database, which is. Uh, it is a, this is for the flexible search like drug, drug and targets by disease for biomarkers and drug scaffold. It's a comprehensive database with information to molecular pathway, links to other databases and this the 3D structures. This is uh, like our own um, uh, from the this the site is from the India. This was developed by the um, uh, professor Agrawala at Intec Chandigarh and this is a very good tool where the all you know good tool where all the based on the structure virulence uh, virtual screening pipeline 5000 small molecules against an array of immune receptors have been re reported and these array re can dis discovered all the ligands for the different cytokines and small molecules for TLR and that TLR4 and different kind of and different cytokines and this this is really very useful. And another important thing is that uh, this is developed by um, our own Indian scientist and this is useful. So Jink is another uh, um, the database which is have the collection of commercially available chemical compounds. It has 35 million, I think, if I am right, 35 million of the compounds available and here we can select the, you know, uh, we can select the different uh, um, molecule based on the name, structure or the different kind of the charge present on, on that and from this database we can you know buy the uh, um, um, molecules also. So another important is the Matador which is a manually annotated target and drug online resource. 
this is the source for protein chemical interaction it direct and it can here we can use the interaction can be both direct and indirect direct interaction contains link to permit or any omim entries and from there you can just uh, take, uh, by just uh, from a click you can understand for what disease it has been used and the whole literature can also come and it's very flexible uh, and flexible to choose indirect interaction or not the stitch is another tool for interaction of the chemicals it, it integrates information here uh, with not only the inf information for metabolic pathway in the, the of the molecule what pathway they will be involved that can also be deciphered their crystal crystal structure then their drug and target relationship and the binding experiment will what it available so these all information is there so drug wise it's the another very important tool it is the it's the, the dominant paradigm in understanding drug drug action focus on the intended therapeutic effects and frequent adverse reactions however this approach may limit opportunities opportunities to grasp an intended drug actions which can open up channels to repurpose existing drugs so in drug wise it is like we use the different initiation perturbation or destination and then we use the pathways to create and this pathway construction will give you like different drugs like here you can see that after the three steps that what are the different perturb what are the biological activity they are involved and from the, this helps in like the user to identify what are the different molecules involved in different biological activity and in this like this also give the transcriptome transcriptomics and phenotypic data and related to drug response so that also give you the side effect also so and so that's why i find it very useful and can be used for the drug an important tool for the drug repurposing and another this is the last part of my talk which i will say that we are for immunoinformatics where we nowadays we are using this uh, the data coming from for, from the large uh, whole genome sequencing and or immunoinformatics for the vaccine designing and you know that for like uh, initial or the traditional vaccine designing a lot of new molecules are synthesized by recombinant dna and then they are expressed in the plasmid then they are given into the cell. they they are given into the cells or transcripted in, into the cells and then people waited with in vitro experiment what kind of the immune response they are generating if they are generating the immune response then take those plasmids and transfer give inject to the mice look for the look for the um, safety measures and look for the protection and that's how we used to make the a just lead molecule for a vaccine but nowadays we say um, if you will use the immune informatics we can change it in a very drastic way like here we can just go for the uh, you know whole genome data of whatever organism you are looking for to make a vaccine from proteomic analysis you can identify the antigens from antigens you can identify the epitopes or the allele prediction in a plan then we can also predict how what how much population is the uh, coverage is there because all these things are important because we know that that uh, different uh, population has different uh, hla or um, molecules present over there and depending upon the what of the kind of the hla molecule are prevalent in a population they can be immune or resistant to you know response to one kind of the vaccine thing. so these two tools are important so after making epitope and allele predictions we add a lot of linkers and adapters to make the vaccine stable and we also add sometimes the adjuvants to make it more immune recognizable and then we go for a lot of primary physiochemical evaluation or in the a lot of a physiochemical evaluation like looking for the aliphatic index their stability isoelectric points solubility then their half life in the in toxicology and then we also do the virtual in silico cloning in like on any kind of expression vector and from there we can make the immune simulation also and make a therapeutic vaccine so uh, i am just system uh, showing here how we can progress uh, uh, for the in silico or multi epitope pro pro vaccine pro production so protein sequences from different organisms are taken like you just take it from in the protein blast which is very easy then you take the whole genome and then if you want to have a your um, 
reference organism or the model organism from there also you can take a reference or you can take several organisms at a time suppose you want to make a vaccine for a multiple when species in multiple strain so you can take a common epitope from there so you can do a protein blast. in blast you can identify depending upon the query cover like whatever they are coming with the 99 percent coverage you can select and you remove all those who are paid, uh, those who are touching with the human or those who are like a, a close to other and uh, remove all those who I remove the protein which are similar to humans and check for protein similar to related species. Then we go for the epitope protection which can be done by the like using online resources like IEDB analysis resource where we give the antibody epitope protection here uh, and these epitopes. Again these epitopes were studied for their what were biological properties stability. Epitopes are also checked for the allergenicity using the server like AIG prayer prediction. So again, from all those who are giving those only non-allergen, those have been those will be selected, and then filter and arrive at a probable protein sequence. These probable protein sequence will be put for the physiochemical evaluation by using the XPC server. From there, we use the proto pro, protoparm which is a tool that allows the computation of various physical and chemical parameters for a given protein so, and then store uh, proteins and then this give the hydrophobicity here then their molecular weight amino acid composition all these will be given by this we can deviate from these tools after these tools we can do the in silico cloning by doing you know codon modification and all this we need to design a vaccine after this, we can put in any expression vector to, depending upon your choice or what kind of disease you are targeting and you can put into the expression vector. And this can be, you know, these kind of the vaccines are not only under, um, good for the, <coughs> for, um, uh, good for the, like, if you this save the times, but these are also good for the further downstream purification of the vaccine because here we can put a lot of, you know, um, molecules by which we can do the affinity purification easily. After then we can also go for the vaccine in silico experimenter for secondary structure de de determination using PSI trade like uh, uh, and these can give you what, uh, what the alpha helix beta stand or what kind of structures are but refinement then this will give the T-cell epitope and add with that. We can plot the Ramachandran plot where, where we can look for the stability. And then finally we can go for the docking. And here you can see that this uh, they are binding. Here we have seen that uh, the epitinia protein is binding against the TLR3. And this means that, that okay, your whatever the vaccine you have designed, it is going to uh, elicite the immune response. So this could be a good probable vaccine candidate. But as you have already added multiple epitopes, so the chances of their success will be much better. So there they, they are several databases for their doing this also. And uh, India BioDB, which is one of the important, uh, uh, India BioDB is one of the important tool, which where we all the software and tools developed by the Indian scientists have been put. This is the brainchild of Professor Raghwa from IIITD and uh, uh, and this is a very good site where they have combined all the resources developed by the Indian scientists in one place. So um, these all are the, about the, the different state of the immunoinformatics and as these are the challenges for immunoinformatics, the absence of reliable and well curated databases at present, mutational pressure when we are low, or gene evolution in the uh, in the pathogens and in the host where that's, that may also affect the whatever the drug you have designed or the vaccine you have designed and the most important is the lack of real-trained manpower with uh, proper understanding of immunology and informatics and hopefully with this uh, after completing all the training modules some of you will be taking this challenge and, and I can very say, say that like the career prospective for all those students are very good. In summary, like immunoinformatics, it involves a lot of artificial intelligence, involves a basic understanding of basic immunology, 
in the understanding of omics the things and then a lot of databases uh, understanding of different databases and software tools and combining all this will give you a very good result if you can make a good uh, pipeline which will be robust and reliable so i would like to finally acknowledge all the people who are contributing for this uh, drug discovery training module and my friends from the and drug discovery hackathon modules dr girinath dr srinivas mr rajiv all these are part and professor kunal is already part of this training mod module also and the, the my slides mostly is prepared by my student dr nana arora and rimon preet the senior most pleased student in my lab our institute at iit mandi which is in himachal and it's a nice place Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, sir, for your informative presentation. Sir, we have received a lot of questions from participants, but due to time constraint, uh, I will take few questions. So, may I start question answer, sir? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Sir. First question is from uh, Devabrata Ghosh. His uh, question is, what is cytokine storm? Okay, so cytokines. First, I will explain that what are, what are the cytokines. These are you can say that these are biological messengers which act like okay, which give signals to other immune cells or other cells that we have got an infection or something is wrong over there. So these cytokines have been divided into different like Th1 and Th2, and these when there is a infl infl inflammation or infection so mostly th1 cytokines like il1 beta tnf alpha if in gamma these will be coming and when this milieu is very high then this is called cytokine storm so what happens when there is a cytokine storm so the body is not able to you know withhold the, or the control this and this cause the bystander injury they due to the other cells get uh, you know damaged and that lead to the organ failure and this is way what going on in case of the covid also like there is a cytokine storm so a number of cytokines in a very exponential way expressed in a short duration this is called cytokine storm thank you sir second question is from uh, hema harilal question is why Uh, there is a high chance of false positive in receptor based screening okay so as i said that for this receptor based screening so what we are doing we are based on the already existing data we are taking the atomic details and crystal crystal structures so these all leads to the use of different binding kinetics but we cannot use the you know solvation and desolvation things at in the virtual screening and that leads to the more of the false positive thank you sir so the third question is is from sachin Su suryan a question is many people are dying because of covid 19 due to over activity of immune response can you give your comment on this okay so in the starting slide i said that we say that pathogens what are the pathogens pathogens which are invading us or or giving a disease are pathogens but what are the pathogens they are not doing anything like just for entertainment they just want to live and propagate okay so that's why this infection is there and then is there like inflammation if you will know about the inflammation what is that it is the basic mechanism of protection by the immune cells wherever there is infection there will be inflammation this inflammation is there to protect the host against the pathogen but what happens when the pathogen load or the pathogen is smart what what they do they will take the advantage of all this inflammatory process and they make themselves happy making and this inflammation will go out of control of the body and when there is more inflammation the immune system will be hyperactive and that's why there will be all death 
So body is trying to protect against the pathogen, but it is going out of control, and that's why the hyperactive or cell of the cells of the immune system, and that's why there is a mortality. Thank you, sir. So I will take one last question uh, from Sonali Raipur. Uh, she is asking till how many days this memory in the immune system lasts? As in case of COVID-19 infection, it emerges again after developing. Yeah. So this memory is of against different pathogens. That is depending upon you know for different pathogens. If you will say if you are like for hepatitis, I am just giving the example of from hepatitis. So hepatitis B, the you know memory is lasting for the uh, hepatitis B infection ever lasting, but in hepatitis C, it will be only 10 to 20 years. Similarly for malaria, the memory will last only for the one to three months. And plus, uh, okay, so it depends upon different pathogen. Uh, so it varies. So we cannot say anything. And for COVID, it is coming like it, it may be that the memory will not last for long. Thank you very much, sir. So thank you for being with us. And we I will request participant to be present for vertical two session at 4 p.m.